Heavenly Father, I bow before you yet again asking for your help to work in our hearts through the word of God that is before us now. We recognize that we need all the help that we can get to live as you have asked us to live and to best imitate and proclaim the glory of God in this world. And so we are asking for your help now. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand your word. Soften our hearts by your spirit working in us and convicting us of sin, confronting the areas of our lives that are not in conformity to your word. Comfort us with the truths of the gospel that give us hope and assurance of our standing with you and transform our lives so that a world around, the world around us might be changed as well. And Lord, as I proclaim these truths, I pray that you would protect me from saying things that are unhelpful or unwise or untrue. And I pray that those things might be forgotten and that what sticks in our minds and hearts are not the words of a man, but the words of God. So I ask, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be acceptable in your sight, my God and my Redeemer. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. When actress Lisa Welkel was 18 years old, starring in the popular show, television show The Facts of Life, she heard a Christian speaker talk about thousands of starving children in the nation of Haiti. In her book, uh, her sort of memoir, she wrote this. My eyes were opened to what a privileged life I lived and how totally unaware I was of what was going on in the rest of the world. I was profoundly moved and convicted. When the service was over, she went to the front, sobbing, dropped her Rolex watch and her diamond and emerald ring into the speaker's coat pocket and asked him to sell them and give the money to help the poor in Haiti. Welkel went home full of conviction. She thought, I could easily live on 10% of my salary. I decided to sell my condominium, rent a nice apartment. It wasn't necessary for a single girl to live in a three-bedroom, two-story condo. I certainly didn't need to be driving around in a Porsche. Selling the car and buying a moderate car would free up thousands of dollars. I had money invested in real estate across the country. If I sold that, the money could feed tens of thousands of children. It was a no-brainer. She said, my zeal was strong. I knew that I had heard from God and that I was doing the right thing. However, there were people who were close to her who thought that she was responding in an extreme way. That this was just the product of fleeting guilt and emotions. They told her that she was being irrational. It was clear as, as clear as God's leading she seemed, she said, my resolve began to break down under the weight of their arguments which seemed full of logic and wisdom. Eventually I abandoned the call, closed my eyes, and returned blindly to living a life that seemed to make sense. And then she tells the rest of the story in her memoir. Less than 10 years later, all that money was gone anyway. A chunk of it had been invested in a high-rise office building in Pittsburgh that went belly up. Another significant portion was in Texas land that dried up during the oil crisis and was eventually foreclosed upon. When I got married, I sold my condo and bought a house during the California real estate boom in the 1980s, only to give it back to the bank three years later when the, later when the bottom fell out of the market. The facts of life was canceled. I spent all the cash I had making payments on everything for as long as I could. And at 28 years old, I was broke. Welkel concludes, God was trying to get me to invest my money in heaven where it would be safe. But I thought it was too risky to take him at his word. 
We've been talking here in Revelation 17 and 18 of the world's system and how strongly it works to lure us in. Even as we've talked about it, we've recognized that what Revelation 17 and 18 is laying out for us is not the rise of the world system, but it's certain demise. The world system is coming to an end. It will be destroyed someday. And this reality is emphasized here in Revelation 18 in the repetition of the woes that are cried out by the kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, and the, the mariners of the sea. As they each one, each group of people, cries out in mourning over the demise of the great city. But it stands in contrast to that mourning that's happening on earth with the joy that is in heaven. We have joy in verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Because God has pronounced judgment against her. God is going to judge the world's system. This is emphasized in Revelation 17 and 18, but... It hasn't happened yet. And as we emphasized in chapter 17, it seems like the world system is just going to continue going and going and going, like there's no end in sight. And as we emphasized here in Revelation 18 last week, that we recognize that because it just continues on and because it is surrounding us, because it's the water in which we swim, that the world is constantly luring us to join it in its system. We are being lured away from God, and toward the world. We talked about what we are being lured to in that. It is grasping the goods of our world and giving up God, turning our backs on God and loving the world. And last week as we talked about that, we talked about the four ways in which the world is luring us into its mold of grasping goods and giving up God. We talked about the fact that it has, that it's, we talked about its pride. The world thinks it will continue on and never be destroyed. That nothing can ever take it down. And so why would we not want to join in the thing that's going to last forever? Remember the words of Babylon? She said, I sit as a queen in verse 7. I am not a widow and I will never see mourning. We talked about the pleasure, the fact that, the, the, that Babylon is full of pleasure, that the merchants of the earth, it says in verse 3, have become rich by the wealth of her luxurious living or sensuality, it says in the NASB. That idea of sensuality is emphasized in verse 9 too. The luxury of sensuality is what's behind that word. The world lures us with its pride, its pleasure, and its prosperity. There is so much to be had out there. And it looks good. Big houses, fancy cars, lots of fun. The world is trying to lure us with its prosperity. And we saw that the prosperity emphasized in the list of cargoes that are no more in verses 12 through 12 through 13. And then the final way that the world tries to lure us is with its parties. It's fun. Just distract yourself from the potential of any of this going away. Distract yourself from the pain of this life and just live it up. However, it says very clearly in Revelation 17 and 18, as I've already emphasized, that that the whole vision is introduced in verse 1 of chapter 17 with this phrase, come here and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, and then is re-emphasized here in chapter 18 in verse 8, for this reason, in one day her plagues will come. Pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire for the Lord God who judges her is strong. And it is this reminder that we need as God's people 
in order to resist the lure of the world, what we need to be reminded of is the fact that this world is coming to an end. That there is a certain judgment coming. That God isn't making things up here in 17 and 18. He isn't saying what he hopes will happen. He is saying what is certain to happen. This world is going to be destroyed. The world and its system. The wealth that surrounds us is going away. It will not last forever. And we, to resist the lure of the world, we need to remember that God is the mighty judge and he is going to judge the world system. And he's going to judge the world system in four ways and these four ways that he's going to judge the world system relate to the four lures that the world tries to tra- attract us with. And I'm going to go backwards through these. So I'm going to start at the bottom of your list on your notes there. The first way that God will bring down the world system is that parties will pause. Parties will pause. And I say pause because they are going to renew again, but they're going to be perfected in the new heaven and the new earth when God recreates it all. They're going to pause For a time here on earth, look at what it says in verses 21 through 23. Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of the mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. You see the deception of the lure of the party. But it's, but it's paused. It stopped. There is no more music. There are no more marriages. There is no more Food being produced even with the sound of the mill being no longer heard. And you know what's very interesting is that one thing I noticed as I was studying this week is that God is actually going to do something to Babylon here. Babylon representing the world system. But God is actually, God actually prophesied earlier in the Old Testament, that he was going to use Babylon to accomplish the very same demise for another great city in the world. And that was the city of Tyre. And Tyre's demise is talked about in a couple of different places. One place in particular is in Ezekiel chapter 26. And it actually follows through to Ezekiel 28, um, which is a significant passage that talks about the fall of the king of Tyre and and compares the king of Tyre to Satan and his demise, his fall. But in Ezekiel 26, is, that's the passage I want to really kind of hone in on here in comparison, because listen to, what he, listen to what God says through Ezekiel the prophet. Thus says the Lord God, Ezekiel 26, 7, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon king of kings, with horses, chariots, cavalry, and a great army. And he goes on to say in verses 12 through 13 of Ezekiel 26, they will make a spoil of your riches and a prey of your merchandise, break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses, throw your stones and your timbers and your debris into the water. So will I silence the sound of your songs and the sound of the harp will be heard in you no more. And so God was going to use Babylon to bring this demise on Tyre and then later on in history or in the future I should say he's going to use he's going to bring him his own his own judgment upon Babylon itself in the same exact way silencing the musical instruments and ending the parties this is actually a prof, there's actually a prophecy against Judah that's similar that he that God is going to send Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, against Judah in Jeremiah 25, 9 and 10. And again, it says there, I will take from them the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. Do you you hear the connections 
to Revelation 18. God gave all of this power to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to bring about the silencing of parties, the the pause of parties, if you will, in Tyre and in Judah, and eventually God's going to do the exact same thing to Babylon. He's going to silence her. In another place, we are told that Babylon will have its music silenced. Isaiah 14 and verse 11 says that your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. When Babylon falls, music's going to stop. When God the mighty judge shows up, the party is over here on earth. You may think that you're, you're invincible when you're partying and you're having a great time, but the party is over when God shows up. No one will be celebrating their sin any longer when God shows up. God's judgment will be the end of what our world likes to think is affirmation. They like to call it affirmation. We should affirm everyone in their lifestyle, whatever it is. Don't be judging anybody. Don't be telling anybody that that what they're doing is wrong or sinful. And when God shows up, affirmation ends. The party's over. Judgment is here. The parties will pause. But not only that, not only will the parties pause, but prosperity will turn to poverty. The prosperity that they lure us with is going to turn to poverty. Revelation 18, 9 and 10 says that the kings of the earth are going to pronounce this woe against them or because they will see the smoke of her burning and they will cry out, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth are going to cry out, Woe, woe to the great city. Who, she was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet. All these signs of wealth and luxury. She was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Verse 17 says, For in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. It's done away with. The wealth is going away too. Even the shipmasters, the mariners of the sea who make their living by the sea, What city is like the great city? Woe, woe the great city, verse 19 says, in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. Again, we see an echo of this in the judgment that God brings upon Tyre through Babylon. In in Ezekiel 26, 11 through 14, They will make a spoil of your riches. I already read this part of verse 12. They will make a spoil of your riches and a prey of your merchandise. He says, with the hooves of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will slay your people with the sword and your strong pillars will come to the ground. He will make you a bare rock, it says. A place for the spreading of nets, but not for living. The prosperity will come to poverty He goes on to say in verses 15 through 16 of Ezekiel 26, Shall not the coastlands shake at the sound of your fall when the wounded groan, when the slaughter occurs in your midst? Then all the princes of the sea will go down to their thrones, remove their robes, strip off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling, and they will sit on the ground, tremble every moment, and be appalled at you. We see this actually emphasized even further in Ezekiel 27. In verse 32, Moreover, in their wailing, they will take up a lamentation for me. This is a lamentation for Tyre after Babylon comes and destroys them. Who is like Tyre? Like her who is silent in the midst of the sea. When your wares went out from the seas, you satisfied many peoples with the abundance of your wealth and your merchandise. You enriched the kings of the earth. Now that you are broken by the seas and the depths of the water, your merchandise and all your company have fallen in the midst of you. God's going to create poverty out of the prosperity. The, the, po- the prosperity is going to be laid waste. There's going to be nothing left. All of the wealth of this world is going away. Just like Lisa Welkel's Porsche, condo, properties, money, gone. But not only will p- prosperity turn to poverty, but pleasure will turn to plagues. This is interesting in Revelation 18. 
that, that there's this sort of repetition of the idea of pestilence and plague that comes up over and over again in this chapter. In verses 4 through 8, it, you see this in particular. It says, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her, to the degree that she has glorified herself and lives sensuously. To the same degree, give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow. I will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine. Everybody's living it up. Everybody's enjoying it. Being satisfied with all of the wealth and all of the stuff and all of the entertainment. Everything that that Babylon has to offer is feeding people. And yet they will, it'll all go away. It's going to be replaced by plagues. It's going to make people miserable rather than satisfied. I think, we, I think we see something similar happening to Tyre as well as Babylon attacks in Ezekiel 26 in verses 8 and 9. It says he will slay your daughters on the mainland and with, with the sword and he will make siege walls against you, cast up a ramp against you and raise up a large shield against you. The blow of his battering rams he will direct against your walls and with his axes he will break down your towers. And he goes on in verse 19 of Ezekiel 26. And says, when I make you a desolate city like the cities which are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you and the great waters cover you, then I will bring, down with, bring you down with those who go to the pit, to the people of old. And I will make you dwell in the lower parts of the earth like the ancient waste places and those who go down to the pit so that you will not be inhabited. But I will set glory in the land of the living. I will bring terrors on you and you will be no more. Though you will be sought, you will never be found again. You see what God, God is replacing the pleasure with terror here. The, it's, it's the plague, the, the terror of plagues. It's not going to last. Even the pleasures that the world offers will go away. And finally, the, their pride will be punished. Their pride will be punished. The parties will pause. The prosperity will turn to poverty. The pleasure will turn to plagues. And the pride will be punished. Again, verse 8. In one day her plagues will come. For the Lord God who judges her is strong. It says that in one hour. You notice that 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 repetition of that one hour, it happens quick. This is not something that's dragged out over days or months. And it shows the might of God that he can take down a city in a mere hour. You think about the wars that have happened in our world and how long they have lasted. I mean, I recognize that, um, that not every war is the hundred years war. But still, one hour... I mean, you, like we're amazed by the six-day war, right? That, that, that the war could last only six days when all those Arab nations tried to attack Israel and that didn't work out so well for them. Six days, we're like, man, I can't even believe it, a war that only lasted six days. The world wars, both of them lasted four to six years in that ballpark, Right? One hour, one hour, it's done. The might of God, the strong arm of God, someone who says, I will never see morning, bam, done, you're gone. Your pride is punished. Ezekiel 26, verses 6 through 11. Again, he says he's going to bring upon Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He will slay the daughters. He will blow his battering rams and he will direct against the walls and his axes will break down the towers. And in 26.17, we are told that 
the inhabited one, Tyre, the city, this great city, this renowned city which was mighty on the sea, she and her inhabitants who impose her terror on all of her inhabitants, they will take up a lamentation for Tyre when Babylon comes and destroys. And the same will happen when God comes to destroy Babylon. And I want you to understand something. The reason why I emphasize these things is because we need to recognize that this demise of the world is guaranteed to happen. Again, I don't know the timing. Paul acted like it was going to happen in his lifetime. John, I think, believed it would happen in his lifetime. And all through church history, the, father, the church fathers and the churches that were established believed that Jesus was coming back to judge the world. And for whatever reason, God in his mercy has delayed that coming until at least now. But it's coming. I believe that this is true. I believe that the world will be destroyed. And given the sure and utter demise of this world system and the world itself, by God, the mighty judge, we should be holy. If we are going to recognize that this world is really coming to an end, then we ought to be separate from the world. I emphasized this last week that the idea of holiness, that the demise of Babylon inspires holiness in God's people. Holiness is being set apart, being different from the world around us. Don't look like the world be different from it. Why would we want to immerse ourselves in a world that is coming to an end? Why would we look for satisfaction, meaning, and identity in what will prove to be woe when God judges? But that, but that still leaves a question in our minds, maybe. What is holiness? What is it supposed to look like? It feels really hard to figure out what holiness looks like. And I agree. I think it's complicated. Unfortunately, holiness is not always black and white. I think there are some issues, I will clarify, that are clearly black and white. It is clearly di the difference between right and wrong But sometimes when we're, when we're in it, when we're living in it, when we're trying to evaluate things, be, when we're trying to look at what's too close to the world and what's too far away, it's complicated. Jesus taught both of the following two truths. In, in Luke chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, it says that he says to his Disciples, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by the means of wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. So here is, here is Jesus telling his disciples, make friends for yourself by means of the wealth of our world. Use the wealth of our world effectively. I think that's Jesus' teaching in Luke chapter 16. But in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, he says this, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. So there is some gray in here. There is a clear right and wrong, but in, there's a little bit of gray that's not always clear how we're supposed to do. How much is too much in your bank account? How much is too much of anything of this world? How do we use the things of earth faithfully to faithfully work for God and to care for our families while at the same time we keep our mind set on the things above? I think I just want to offer you some principles. Principles that you could maybe use to determine, to maybe evaluate things as you evaluate them. I think the best way is not for me to say, okay, Here's an amount that you can have in your savings account, and that's okay. And here's an amount that, you know, this is too much. That's not going to be helpful. But rather, for me to give you principles that you can, you can, you're making a decision, you can run through these biblical principles, and you can say, okay, I think I know what the wisest decision to make in this case is. And so, um, 
So let me offer these biblical principles. The first is to work hard. Some of these, by the way, I owe to um, Randy Alcorn in his book, uh, Money and Possessions, which um, I think would be a valuable read. So the first is to work hard. Work hard. 1 Timothy 5.8 tells us that if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You're actually worse than an unbeliever by not providing for your family. So um, if you just sit at home and say, well, I'm not living for the things of this world, you won't have a home, um, but you'll also be worse than an unbeliever because you're not caring for your household. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul commends hard work. He says, um, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. So work hard. Like this is, this is an important part of who we are as people on earth that God has given us responsibility to work hard. I think a second principle, live simply. Live simply. Keep deception and lies far from me is the prayer of Solomon in, in Proverbs chapter 30 and 8 and 9. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. In other words, give me enough that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? And that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. So he says, God, just give me enough. It's the prayer of Jesus, right? Give us this day our daily bread. In that book, Randy Alcorn says this. He says, we say there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rich. God says people who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. We say there's nothing wrong with being eager to get rich. God says one eager to get rich will not go unpunished, Proverbs 28, 20. We say the rich have it made. Jesus says it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19, 23. I think when, we, when you live simply, this is, a, this is an important principle to apply to our lives because it will help us with a lot of other things like avoiding debt, worrying less, um, and, and battling what Randy Alcorn calls affluenza, the affliction of wealth. So live simply. Figure out ways to live simply. Don't make your life more complicated than it has to be. And, and uh, our world is very good at making our lives more complicated than they need to be. Another principle is to give generously. Give generously. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. And, and in that context, Paul is emphasizing generosity all the way through 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. In fact, he's going to say in 2 Corinthians 9 that he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, that is all generosity, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. God gives to us, Jesus gives of himself to us so that we can give of ourselves to others. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. Love. Love others. Let let the goodness of God in your life be a conduit or become a conduit to being good, God's goodness in the lives of others. Bless others with God's goodness in your life. Fourthly, be satisfied theologically. Be satisfied theologically. This is probably a horrible way to say this. And you can tell that Randy Elkhorn's better with words because he came up with some of the other ones and I came up with this one. But be satisfied theologically. What I mean by this is be satisfied by God. Be satisfied with who God is rather than looking for satisfaction in all of the stuff of our world. In Psalm chapter 42 and verses 1 and 2, the psalmist says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. Do you long for God? Do you thirst for God? Do you thirst to know God? To appear before him? To hear from him? Philippians chapter 4 and verses 11 through 13, Paul talks about being content. He says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. 
I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You can be strengthened to satisfaction through God. That's the point of Philippians 4, 13, that God can strengthen you to be satisfied. You can be satisfied in God. And I'm going to tell you, although I don't live this very well, this is probably the most convicting thing for me to say, but like God is way more satisfying than any steak you will eat, any house you will own, any car you will own, any money you have in your bank account. That God is better than all of those things. You want God. And all those other things can go away. And by the way, I think this applies in a broader scale, not just to our finances, but also to the entertainment that our world offers us because the world is constantly trying to draw us in with, to look for satisfaction. Fill the hole in your soul with movies and television. It's not even really filling the hole in your soul, is it? It's just merely distracting you from the hole in your soul. You feel the hole, and you're trying to fill it. And you're like, well... Oh, maybe this will help. And you watch it, or you listen to it, or you do the thing, you seek the pleasure, and, and what happens? It, it just masks the hole. It just kind of like, it's pretending like the hole isn't there, rather than filling it with the only thing that can satisfy, and that is God. Be satisfied theologically. You should also look up. Look up. Keep your eyes up. <laughs> look toward heaven. Colossians 3. One through three. If you've been raised with Christ, that is, you've been saved, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Your citizenship is in heaven, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. So live like you're a citizen of heaven. And then I, I think there's one last thing that I would add to that too, and that is to... I don't have a nice phrase for this one. Just, but just let God be the master. Let God be the master, right? You can't serve two masters. Matthew chapter 6, you can't serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other or love the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money, so you've got to keep the real master in, in line, in, on the throne. Keep God on the throne. And I just, I have to mention one more thing because I think this is essential to all of this because this is all grounded in the gospel, right? I, I, I hope you recognize that, but it is, it is emphasized here in Revelation chapter 18 because we remember that God is judging her for her sins. He is remembering her iniquity. This is emphasized, it's, it's there in verse 5. Now the gospel, the word gospel means good news. You're probably all aware of that. But news can only be good if we know what bad news is, right? I mean, otherwise it's just news. If all news is good news, then it's just news. It's not, there's no difference. If there's, there has to be bad news to contrast with the good news. So there has to be some bad news. And Revelation 18 is kind of focused on a lot of the, the bad news here. It emphasizes that people are sinful. They're living in rejection of God. This is who we are as people. This is what we're born into. We're born into rebellion against God and doing our own thing. Instead of trusting God, the creator and owner of all things, we are much more likely to trust the world system for our security and satisfaction and salvation. This is our sin. This is one of our sins. And God will judge this sin as will he judge all sins. And Revelation 18 only brings this sin to the surface and says, hey, look, this is you. You're sinning like this too. This is just another one of your many sins, refusing to trust God for your security, satisfaction, and salvation. And God is already judging these things. He's already judging this sin. He's only judging it partially now and in different places in the world. But someday it's going to happen about, it's going to happen in a full and complete way in the entire world. The whole system's going to collapse. It's going down. God's judgment is sure because God, who judges her, is strong. And it's going to happen in an hour. 
is what we're told here. Or at least quickly, if you want to take that figuratively. And this is the end that all sin deserves. The same destruction by the same mighty judge is the destruction that all sin deserves. And no one can escape it because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And this means that we are all headed toward unending death, destruction, and isolation from God. This is where we will end up. This destruction. This demise. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 says, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Certainly not the covetous, which it mentions in verse 10, nor swindlers. If you think that you can survive this judgment, just remember that the God who judges is strong, Revelation 18.8. But this is where the good news comes in. There is good news in here. That's why we call it the gospel, right? God took the judgment on himself so that we can escape the judgment. We don't have to face this judgment. Right after Paul writes those words, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, he says, but all are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. You see, just as we are all guilty, we all can be justified. We all can be declared righteous by God in spite of our sin, declared righteous through the propitiation of Christ. Christ took the judgment of God on himself so that we don't have to. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, after it says that, that these unrighteous do not inherit the kingdom of God. That the covetous and the swindlers and the ungodly do not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, such were some of you. You were that. But you were washed. You were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. You see, through Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God, we are transformed. We are delivered from the demise of Babylon and the world system. And that is why we come to the Lord's table. That is why this table is so important. It symbolizes our escape from the judgment of Revelation 18. This is a reminder that instead of facing judgment from God, we are welcome to the table of God, the Lord's table. It symbolizes the everlasting satisfaction of God in the elements that represent the body and blood of Christ. The everlasting satisfaction of God that contrasts the sure end and emptiness of the world system. And it symbolizes our justification, reconciliation, and salvation. That's why this table is so important, and it's why we gather around it. Lord God, thank you for a hope that never dies. Thank you that you offer something that this world can never give. Everlasting life with you. What a tremendous reality. What a glorious hope. And Lord God, as we embrace that hope, I pray that we would set our minds on things above and not on the things of this earth. That we would look forward to the feast of heaven with Christ much more than we look forward to the feast on earth that leaves the whole. And Lord God, I pray that you would help us to find satisfaction completely in you so that we might be in the world but not of it. For your glory, we pray this. That the gospel might be spread to the world around us. That hearts and lives may be transformed here in Liberty Baptist Church, in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, and everywhere around this globe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.